The following is a presentation of the Match Talk Podcast Network. Hello, wrestling fans. It's time for the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. The World Wrestling Resource was made that you as a wrestler, parent, coach, or fan can have access to all the resources of the very best in the world of wrestling. I'm three-time wrestling writer and broadcaster of the year, Jason Bryant. And I want you to join me, along with John McGovern and world champions Terry Brands and Dennis Hall, as we talk training tips, topical discussion, mental preparation, and more on the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. World Wrestling Resource is sponsored by Defense Soap. Find World Wrestling Resource on Facebook at facebook.com slash worldwrestlingresource. And follow us on Twitter at WWRESO. And, of course, on the web at worldwrestlingresource.com. Now on to the show as we join John McGovern, Terry Brands, and Dennis Hall. Episode 32 of the World Wrestling Resource Podcast. Back in the saddle again. I can't remember who sang it. It might have been Aerosmith, but uh, we were with Dennis Hall and Terry Brands. We're going to be talking Rio 2016, Olympic Games. Uh, both these guys had athletes from their respective clubs and... Uh, Ready to go for the Olympic Games, and we'll just we'll just start with Dennis Hall. First of all, Dennis, every four years the world comes together for this Olympic Games type of thing. Uh, both you and Terry have been a part of the Olympic team with the United States, and when when you come home and you, you you know what's the decompression phase like when you you know you're like all right I'm done let's uh, let's just chill out. What, what what goes through the mind of an athlete once they're done with the games? You know, it depends if you won a medal or you didn't. I mean, I I was in uh, three Olympic Games, and, you know, the uh, time I won the medal, you come home, and it's a lot of fun, but it's still hectic because you got all different types of interviews and functions to go to. When you don't win the medal, you come home pissed off and, uh, you know, thinking about what went wrong, and you're festering on that so it, it's a little bit different uh you definitely want top down time where you can um you know just enjoy life again because up to that point you probably had uh three and a half to four years uh nothing but training and focusing on that event and terry what was the what were the situations like for you well i think it's the same um you know i i went to one olympic dennis was in three so he's more of the, uh, I guess the, the, you know, he had a lot of different ways to feel about it. I did not win a gold medal either. And so that was really bitter for me. And, um, the decompression was probably different than it would have been if you went. So, you know, but really for, for me, it was, you know, did not accomplish what you set out to accomplish. And a lot of, uh, just, just uh you know bitter um kind of probably took it to an unhealthy level in your in your mind on you know how how you deal with that and move forward so terry in your case what are you gonna what do you do what do you tell dan dennis to make sure that he doesn't go with the unhealthy decompression i mean because you said you just explained that you know you may not want to well, go that well what, what do you tell dan dennis in this situation he the thing with Dennis is, is, and, and this is hard for me to say because we have an audience of people listening and, you know, I don't want them to get the wrong impression of what we're about, but there's a very few people who really know how good he is. And now nobody's going to really know how good he was because he didn't prove it. And, you know, it's kind of like, you know, I mean, I remember Lincoln McElrady. You know, he was probably the best guy in the world, but he never won that world championship. So he really never was the best guy in the world. And it's a, it's kind of the same thing with him. You know, he goes out there against Dubov, who was ahead of 4-0, four, four ahead of everybody. <clears throat> took him down and gutted him right off the bat. Well, our guy, he took down and gutted him and then gutted him again, gutted him again, gutted him again. And that's not, that's not Daniel. He's better than that. He knows he's better than that. We know he's better than that. But you got to prove it when you step out there. And so it's it's frustrating. It, it creates a, a a really really bitter down feeling. And he even used the word, you know, um, um, like letting people down and let people down. And so you got to get him to a point where, 
you know, he knows that he didn't give it up. He didn't put his head down on the mat. He fought. He just got caught in a situation that he wasn't ready for and probably needed some more, you know, international matches throughout, you know, his, his career after he got out of, out of, uh, college and you know what now you got to move forward you got to keep your head up you know you got you got a lot of things you can give back to the sport and you know that's how you get them through it talk to them about what's healthy not about what's not healthy all right dennis now when we talk with ben provisor now he's been on two teams uh his performance even though he lost his opening round match to Rustam Asakala from Uzbekistan. He went out there and basically he broke. He got down early, but then broke the guy. Um, and, and I believe um, a couple of buddies that do the, the the blood round podcast basically said he met calfed him, which in their mind means he's worn their opponent down so much they cannot win their next match. And it ultimately is it, you know it ends up being like well crap I, I guess I shouldn't have taken it so hard on him. But uh, you know Ben went out there and really took it to him. Uh, what, what do you talk? To, what do you tell Ben uh, when when he comes back to, to Wisconsin, like, all right, let's, uh, let's warm up again. I mean, what's, what's the mindset there from a coach to an athlete? You know, I, what, what I already told him, I told him, I said, that was the best match you ever wrestled in your life. You made one mistake and it cost you, you know, a chance to medal. Um, we got to get better at, at the position uh, that beats you, you know, and it was parterre as usual for Greco Roman wrestling. And, you know, our guys need more time on target with people that can lift, that can gut, that that are uh, good from overseas. You know, it's the same old, same old story. I'm I'm tired of it. If if you want to be able to defend a gut wrench at the Olympics or World Championships, you need guys on top of you for a three, four month period. You know, the answer is it. The answer isn't going over there and getting more matches more matches, you're going to get the same results. You're going to continually get lifted or gutted and nothing's going to change. We're going to keep coming home without medals. And so I told him, I said, you got to get a partner and you got to get guys over here training here. Instead of going out of your comfort zone, bring guys to the stage. You'll have great partners every day and uh, we'll fix the little things. I said, you don't realize how close you are to winning a world-level medal. You broke a guy that was second in the world last year, and the guy couldn't even wrestle back in his next match. He, his gas tank was empty. So I think he sees we're on the right track physically so better, than, uh, better than I have ever seen him. So, you know, it's just come back, get back to the drawing board, and go win a medal next, uh, next fall. Now, as we look at Rio 2016 as a whole, Terry, you were down there. Dennis, you were not. So, Ter- Terry, I want to get your perspective of, you know, Rio as a whole. It was a lot of a lot of media feedback about how bad this was going to be. I was down there for two and a half weeks. I thought it was fine. Uh, you know, what were your, your perspectives of Rio itself? They say that about every Olympics. You know, I remember even Sydney when you're moving in and they're bitching about the plastic chairs and this and that. You know, in Athens, well, the Greece, they're they're uh, they're always late and this and that, and getting it done. And it, it's it's not. I mean, it was, I thought it was awesome. I mean, it's the Olympics. Your plumbing in your in your uh, in the Olympic Village didn't work right. For crying out loud! Okay, so what? Go get a plunger, you know. And that's the way. That's my attitude on that stuff. So uh, it was awesome. I thought the organization. They said the traffic was horrendous. It really wasn't that bad. I mean, they, it really wasn't. I mean, to get, you know, down, even down to where the, you know, the Olympic house was and things like that, it was a way, it was an hour and a half drive, but it was an hour and a half drive because that's how far it was. That's kind of how I saw it. Yeah, and I was actually staying in Copacabana trying to get to Baja Tijuca, and, you know, if by the metros it was two trains and a bus and then a mile walk. That was about two hours. Then we got the taxi. I mean, we're looking at it because it's like it's no different from going to uptown Manhattan to to lower town. I mean, it's like it doesn't it's not that far geographically mileage wise, but that's just how long it takes because that's how many people live there. Rio is a giant city. Um, people don't realize it's three times the size of Chicago, for example. But uh, I had no problems. Well, that's what I saw too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I had no problems. I saw one mosquito the entire time. So uh, <laughs> I didn't, you know, and uh, I, I I can't, you know, it's just like when I go to New York City. And I'm uncomfortable on the subway. Guess what? My, where my where's my wallet? It's in my front pocket. Same thing in, in any city, any big city. I'm taking precautions. Foreign or domestic. So uh, those of you who were worried about uh, Rio, that was kind of there was some overblown stuff there. But uh, 
Anyway, well, things are going to happen. the stuff they use to kill the mosquitoes, I'm telling you right now, the, the oil with the fogger stuff that they drove around with the trucks, that was worse than Zika. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm i with you on the mosquito thing. I, I would never fail. I mean, I was out running in the jungle and um, doing things like that out at Lonear where the High Performance Center was and never had any... I mean, I, I, like I said, it was it's 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 just like being here, except for you there, and that's where the Olympics are. So you show up, and you you know you contend for a gold medal when you when you get there, and that's you know what we were wanting to accomplish. So I, I tell you one thing, I know the announcer for the for the wrestling was spot on. That's all I can tell you. <laughs> His name's Jason Bryant. What a voice! Very impressive. Very impressive. Well, I appreciate that, Coach. That's uh, it's, that's high praise. And uh, I'll tell you what, from my perspective, it was uh, definitely an interesting experience because, uh, you know, you got to go French, Portuguese, and English, and working with three people in one event, it's, that's, that, that's, that's a challenge, too. But uh, as, we, as we talk about the wrestling, uh, let's just start with Greco because Greco went first. Dennis, um, we've, you've already touched on Provisor a little bit, but and a little bit about the performance, about how, you know, we, we need to get better on top and, and, and defending Parterre, but... Overall performances, Matt Lillen's first cycle through. Uh, if you were to give it a letter grade based on where he what he picked up when he started versus uh, where we're at right now, I mean, what do you think uh, uh, Coach Lillen and staff could have done a little better? What do you think they did well? And and sometimes you know it, you can chalk up things to having a bad day, but uh, you know where did you see the Greco performance? You know, it's disappointing with no medals, but where where do you see it as with your expert opinion? I mean, you you want a letter grade? Uh, yeah, why not? F. We didn't do what we needed to do. I mean, the bottom line is, how do you know you ain't got to have a uh, gut wrench or lift defense? I mean, that, that has to be a primary focus. I mean, I, I brought guys in specifically overseas to gut wrench me and lift me and, and beat the hell out of me. I think, uh, you know, I mean, physically the guys were were prepared you know, their their physical preparation, all the guys were in shape. They were ready to battle. But you know what? We didn't attack the area where we were weakest, and it bit us in the ass every single time. So, I mean, it, it's tough to, you know, we the guys were strong. The guys were in shape, but we weren't technically prepared. And that, to me, is the biggest problem. I mean, you can be as physically prepared as you want, but if you can't defend a gut wrench or a lift, you're out of every single match. And that's where we got beat in all four matches was in parterre defense. You know, it comes down to that. I, you know, the performance, I thought, I thought the Americans battled hard. They, they went out, they fought, but you know what, when they went down, they didn't look comfortable. And, you know, that, that's a tough part, you know, you, you only got so much time and you got to attack your weakness. I mean, where can you make the biggest difference in your wrestling career? It's in a position that you aren't strong. You know, we work so much on our feet or we, we work so much on top, but, but we don't put enough time into where it really needs to be put. Now, one thing that you've also preached over the years on this show has been toughness and, and getting getting meaner. Do you think the guys had that had that part taken care of this time around? They were tough. They were mean. It was just uh, the way you explained it. It was just a, a technical issue that they had to they have to fix. Yeah, I think so. I, I think the toughness is there. There's no doubt about it. All four of those guys are tough and, and mean. But, you know, it, it, it comes down to the technical um, with provisor. I mean, and it comes down to a lot of little things that the average person doesn't see. In provisor's match, when he got went, got put down and uh, tur- and lifted, um, I remember thinking, get him down and parterre quick. You know, Ben looked at the referee and kind of took 15 probably 10 15 seconds to get down and parterre and i'm thinking get down i you know i i didn't understand why the coaches weren't yelling at him to get in parterre because that would have forced the other guy to get on top quicker and that guy was tired at the time you know it's those little things that make a big difference you know anytime i got put in parterre i wanted to punch the referee but i was okay (laughs) with it you know um, I got down to parterre as quick as I could because I knew the guy was tired, and then I'd yell at the, not yell at him, but I'd make the guy get on top of me as quick as possible. And it's those little things that make a difference. 
You know, if, if the visor had gotten down, maybe he didn't, doesn't get lifted or lifted because the other guy's exhausted. So it's it's little things. I mean, I I think the area we got to work on too is our our mental uh, mental strategies. A lot of times, um, our athletes, you know, there's little things that that break our athletes, and you know, I think working with the sports psychologist would be beneficial to everybody on the team. Because they help you help you identify what are some of the issues in your matches and and some of the things that consistently come up. Now we look at the future of Greco Roman. Uh, Provisor young enough to probably go for a third cycle. Uh, Thilke young enough to do the same thing. We're still, I guess, the question marks around uh, Besic and Robbie Smith, and then Trials champs Joe Rao probably got another cycle in him, and Rayvon Perkins maybe two more cycles in him because the the kid just loves wrestling, but. Where do you see the future, Greco? I mean, do you, do you think what what do these guys got to do the next four years to win Olympic medals? Outside they of to, work on that technique, they need to get some support from USA Wrestling. Um, you know, I, I what, what cracks me up is how you know our guys in Greco, you know, don't get to have the coach that they're totally comfortable with all the time in their corner at the biggest event of their life. So number number one, I, I think they need a little bit more support. Everybody, nobody likes to talk about these issues. You know, um, freestyle wrestling has how many college programs that, that wrestle freestyle in the spring and, and summer, you know, that train more athletes to wrestle freestyle. So that automatically broadens the pool of athletes that, that are competing. And, uh, you, you know, we got to get some of the college, got college coaches on board with um, helping recruit athletes and getting athletes to wrestle Greco. I mean, right now, Terry's probably got four or five guys down at the University of Iowa that, you know what, would be great Greco wrestlers if, if we could get them to do it. And I know I I know Terry and Tom don't shy anybody away from it, but we need coaches to buy into Greco and say, hey, wrestling is wrestling, man. It's about competing, about being the best at whatever style of wrestling you want. And that's one of the areas where in the U.S. we we don't get the support, and it's killing us. You know, a lot of our past uh, world and Olympic medalists have wrestled at the college level. You know, myself included, even though I left college early, I had one year at Madison, and that year at Madison helped me learn how to grind through things. So, um, to me, that's that's a huge thing that needs to be fixed with uh, for Greco. I, you know, we need our athletes getting time on target with foreign wrestlers, good foreign wrestlers that are really good in parterre. That's if uh, parterre still is still a factor after these Olympics. Yeah, that's something I have to wait on. Terry, uh, you know, anything on that thought? I know you and Dennis have known each other a long time, and he mentioned, uh, you know, the, the Hawkeye room there specifically, but uh, you got a take on this? Yeah, I certainly agree. I don't know the answer. I'm not, I'm not, you know, in the position to, you know, be able to make the changes there and and talk about implementation, but I do know that, you know, we do. We have Sam Stoll and Corey Clark and um, Paddock and a couple of those guys that Jeremiah Moody from Wisconsin, and they've all had um, pretty good experiences with, with Greco-Roman. Corey Clark's got a really good feel on parterre with his gut wrench and his reverse body lift, and he can hand fight and pummel really well. And, he, you know, he he would be good there. Stoll, obviously, was a bronze in the junior world. So what he says is correct. Um What's the solution there? Well, you got to make a team. And then when you make a team, you got to train. And when you train, you got to have partners that can push you and get you to where you are competitive based on what the rest of the world is doing. So what Dennis is saying is dead on. And I don't know that it takes a genius to figure that out. I think that Dennis is a genius in the sport of wrestling. And that's why he has it figured out because he spends a lot of time thinking about that. If, if the trend is reverse body lifts and that's what's winning matches, then we got to get good at doing those and defending them. And the same thing with gut wrenches. If the trend is parterre and that's where the points are being in the forced positions are being scored, then we got to become very, very efficient and expert in those areas. 
And how do you do that when you don't have experts in your country? Well, you got to go out and you got to get the talent and you got to bring it onto your home soil. You know, it's like he said earlier, way early in this, in this one and several other broadcasts where he's talking about, uh, we're, we're going to Baku to, to wrestle. Well, I don't know if that's the answer. And I agree with him. I don't think that's the answer either. The answer is, you know, 45 minutes to an hour every morning with, you know, foreigners on top of you and you on top of them. So what he says is right. Now, what's the answer? How do you get there? Well, you got to have resources. You got to have resources. Exactly. You got to find, you got to find the guy, you got to find the money and to, to, to have the excuse that, you know, it's just like with this cadet team, they're not going to fund this year. Like the cadets are paying half their, their world championship team. Well, we don't have the money. Bull crap. Go find the money. Go find the money. Care. Make it a priority. Yeah, make sure. it important. Make it important. The governing body should make it important to find the money to fund these situations that we're talking about. We'll move on to our next point. I think we can talk about that pretty much every single episode, gentlemen, because that seems to be a theme that we've brought up time and time again. But before we get to the men's freestyle, I want to get in here with uh, the monumental win that uh, the United States had with Helen Maroulis, not just becoming the first United States woman to win an Olympic championship, but the way she did it in preventing one of the greatest wrestlers, man or woman, to ever walk the earth, Saori Yoshida, preventing her from winning her fourth medal. It was it was a Rulon-esque type of win, and unfortunately it was overshadowed by some some jerk swimmer uh, lying about what he was doing out, out gallivanting at night, so the national media didn't really have a chance to really focus on Helen Maroulis, but from a wrestling perspective, I want to start with with Terry on this. This is big, not just for the United States, but this is big for little girls around the world and around the country specifically. That So, okay, we've got one. We've got a role model. We've got somebody that worked hard, that found that had that wrestler's mentality going, this isn't working for me. I'm going to go get a different coach, and I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my mentality. Um you know, spiritually, athletically, everything. Helen Maroulis is a great story for the United States wrestling. I agree. I agree. You know, Helen of Troy started a war and Helen of Morales started a revolution. Or <laughs> Helen of America like started a revolution. I like and that. And she, you know, that, that's what I said. I said, Helen of America, gold medal, Rio. Um, what she did is exactly right. You know, and you have your peers and they're going, that's not as monumental as the Corellan. Uh, defeat and this and that. And that's, that's not true. That's not true. This is very monumental. You go to Japan and ask those people how monumental this is. You know, and, and here's the other thing. The Russian couldn't get it done against Eko. Our girl got it done against Yoshida. And that's an American thing. That's a trend. <laughs> you know, it takes an American to knock those perennials off. Now we just got to get the perennials. And so that's really what would be the next step. And we got one there with Snyder. Uh, winning a world and, a, and an Olympic gold medal before he's 20 or as he's 20 years old. Um, so it looks good with our gold medal winners. It looks good with our gold medal winners. And, and what Helen did, I, I agree with you. I love it. I think it's so awesome. And, and she, you know, that match, it was, it, it, she shut her down. Yeah. You know, she'd have gotten to some shots that, you know, that, that were deep. And Helen did a good job of beating her where, her strength was with the flexibility through her knee and her hip there with that turned down uh, counter. And, and, you know, it was just, it was, it was brilliant. And then she forced her to panic and forced that headlock, <laughs> you know, and, and now you're ahead four to one and you short time left, you know, you're, you're going to knock off the 16 world level gold medal winner. Thir- I think it was 13 world titles and three Olympic golds, right? Yeah, it was, it was, so, I mean, it was nasty crazy. good. It is crazy. I don't care if it's girls wrestling or women's wrestling or boys wrestling or men's wrestling. It's, that's a crazy accolade, uh, a person full of accolades to knock off and knock out of there. Well, yeah, let's look at it from a, you know, you got to put everything in perspective. Well, when you're the best at your sport for that long, when you get beat, it makes a story. I mean, we were talking uh, Ronda Rousey about how much she dominated the women's MMA, and that much that's like how dominant it is to be that much that good. What well, Yoshida Rousey's not in the same universe as Yoshida or Icho, not even close. And then what not we saw, even close. That we see what Helen does. I mean, it, and it's just one of those things. And she was kind of under the radar because uh, I know Adeline was getting a lot of the press in terms of uh, women's wrestling. Helen did have a little bit of press with the History Channel, but. 
You know, my, my little daughter was wearing a Helen, Helen Marula shirt the day she won it. And, you know, it, it's, it's for, for me, I mean, I don't know if my kids are ever going to wrestle. I got two girls, but the fact is I can, I, you know, as a wrestling parent, I'm going to have an opportunity to put a Helen Marula's poster on my daughter's wall and not have any, and you'd be like, yes, I can do that. You know, we can do that with women's sports a lot. You can put Venus and Serena Williams posters on your daughter's walls. You can put Sue Bird or, you know, the, the, the WNBA superstars, Elena Deladon. Now we got a wrestler that we can do that too as well. And I think that's one thing for, for mothers, daughters, and fathers that love the sport of wrestling that's super important. Dennis, I want to get your take on, on from a, you know, your, your perspective on, you know, what, what Helen and her performance do, does for, for American wrestling. Oh, it's huge. Uh, number one, it shows every one of the people that, you know what, you can beat the legend. Yeah, it should give you confidence that if you train right, you do things, you live clean, that you got a shot. And, uh, you know, the other thing that it does is it gives a lot of young girls a hope that, hey, we can make it to that Olympic finals and win it. It's it's not a, a thing that we can't accomplish. I have a girl in my wrestling club right now it's heading over to uh the cadet world championships pretty soon and uh it was a big thing for her to see that and i think uh right now she's gonna forego wrestling in high school this next year you know and just focus on freestyle and and competition and and getting better freestyle at free women's freestyle so i mean it is a big thing and you know my hat's off I uh, take the hats off to her because it's it ain't an easy job when you're in there and the pressure's on and being able to deal with all that and, and making the impossible possible. So it, that was a great job by Helen. Now, as we jump over to freestyle, we can talk about uh, we can break down the women's uh, performances. But uh, again, we're, we've got a freestyle expert and a Greco expert here. But now, I guess before we even get to Snyder and Cox and their medals, I think everybody around the world is going, what, what, what's the deal with Jordan Burroughs? Um, Terry, here's my, here's my non-wrestling tactical opinion on it. I just I can only chalk this up as simply by saying he had a bad day. That's the only thing I can really come up with that makes logical sense to me. But uh, from what you know about uh, you know, Burroughs' training, his mindset, everything, he seems to do everything right. You know, I guess the saying is, Mama said there'd be days like this. I mean, what, what was your opinion on what happened with Burroughs? I think you're you're there. I think that it obviously what you say is obvious. I mean, it was a bad day for him and you know, we don't know you know the ins and outs and I'm not going to really speculate on you know what I think went wrong. I think that um there's it's one of those things that just rips your guts out when you watch it because he even as somebody who you know, I mean, I, here's the thing. Here's the thing. This is my this is my problem with it. Um, really, really hard on me. We have a guy that is becoming a world icon, and we have a guy that is has beaten the Russians, um, and then he loses to Sargush in 2014 in Tashkent, and then he beats Gedoy of last year in. Vegas. And then we have this second round matchup set up, you know, and everybody's looking past his first round. So that first round match, don't overlook it. Don't overlook it. I was talking to like five or six guys around me in the stands. I'm thinking you guys are whacked out of your minds. If you think that this is a foregone win, because that guy is athletic and he challenges Jordan's speed. And that's where he could get in trouble. And I don't know if, if that's what happened, if, if he, if he, you know, overlooked him or not him because he doesn't, but if, if, you know, we did as a staff or as a country and he had to burn a lot of energy in that match. If you notice, he shut down after he got ahead yeah. and he was off with his nerves. He was off with his ability to be able to push through certain things that he's pushed through his entire career on the um, international circuit. So, you know, now take a look at the Russian match with the head cut. Now take a look at the match with uh, Beck, you know, um, it kind of starts to make sense a little bit. So yeah, he did have a bad day, but there's reasons why we have bad days and that's pure speculation. 
And, you know, I could get into some other things and opinions, or I think I hold them to myself. But for the most part, you know, it's just one of those things, you know. The Russian wasn't going there to lose. You know, he had his attention from last year in Vegas. And he, he, he was going to do whatever he could to get this hand raised, and that's what happened. So there you have it. Yeah, and from a, from a perspective of when somebody's, you know, I, I don't believe we're seeing the last Jordan Burroughs by any means. He's 28. I think he's got another cycle in him. He might take some time off. But So, Terry, do you think in a, in a situation like this where – an athlete probably should take, you know, six months, maybe, maybe, uh, one year of the cycle off to get, you know, get their bearings back. Or, you know, uh, it's hard to say if you were, if you were Burroughs coach, but, you know, what, what would your suggestion be based on what you know about, uh, how he and Mark Manning and Brian Snyder train together and, and maybe, okay, uh, you know, you having, having a family and, and dealing with all those things that go, that go with it. Well, you got it. Number one, you got to decompress and whether he wrestles this next season or not, or this next, uh, 2017 for Paris or not, it, that's irrelevant. You still have to do the right thing to get your body ready to compete again. So that's number one. And then see how it goes day by day. Um, hey, you know, wh- wh- where are you at? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Well, I don't know. Well, then you don't know. You don't know. That's fine. That's fine. And it's okay that you don't know. And you may not know until the trials. You may, you know, miss the U.S. Open in April even. You know, the guy, you know, the guy doesn't need to, 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 you know, wrestle in a lot of those, doesn't need a lot of matches. You know, it's, it's not like the Greco guys where they, where he needs to feel a guy or feel more international feels. It's not that. So it's about what does he want to accomplish? When does he want to accomplish? And when is he ready to start getting ready to accomplish it? That's probably the biggest thing. And you got to do it right. You got to do it right because otherwise you're going through it in an unhealthy way. And, and psychologically, when you're doing something that you're not ready to do, it's very, very difficult on your, on your mindset and your emotions. And then your physical part just goes to hell. So, you know, it's all interconnected there. Now we'll talk about the, the medals that we did pick up as a country. Jaden Cox, a bronze medal. Uh, Kyle Snyder, as you said, went back to back winning a world and Olympic title. Not very many. Uh, wrestlers in U.S. history have ever done that. And uh, Jaden wrestled first. Let's start with him. Uh, the, the the questionable situation in the semifinals where uh, it, it's believed that he thought he was ahead on criteria. Uh, this is where the, the, the criteria argument seems to rear its head again because the caution uh, trumps things and last point scored, blah, blah, blah. Ultimately, at 21 years old, wins a bronze medal. Take take the, the controversy about, uh, you know, whether he thought he was winning or losing uh, – out of the situation. This is a 21 year old kid right off the college mats that it wasn't super versed in the senior level freestyle winning a bronze medal. That's, that's something you got to be proud of. I mean, that, that, that goes without saying, but uh, you know, Terry, your thoughts on, on 21 year old Jaden Cox taking a bronze medal and, and just being, you know, literally a whisker away from the finals. Well, coming in, you're, you're, you know, leave, uh, I should say leaving there coming into the airplane. You know, I, I was overwhelmed uh, with happiness for him just because of the way that he was. And, you know, I, for me, I mean, I'm, I, I hated my bronze medal. I still hate it. I, you know, but there's people, you know, they're different than I am. So, you know, when I look at him and what he, how happy he is and how he accomplished that and what it does for, you know, us, it's another medal. It's another medal. But, you know, I, I, I feel like there was something left there. I feel like there was something left there. And that was a chance to contend at, you know, a weight class where, you know, certainly one of the, you know, the most, the, one of the best wrestlers pound for pound in the world, what he would have been able to wrestle against for the gold medal. And that's a lost opportunity. It goes back kind of what Dennis was saying with, you know, your corner coach, you know, maybe, maybe reverse that role, put, put Jaden's, um, uh, familiarity coach in the dominant corner. And maybe, just maybe, we have a different situation. I don't know. I'm not saying. And, you know, I don't know that Bill knows Jaden well enough yet to where he was able to get his attention and get that understanding out there because I know that, that you know, Bill Zadig knew the situation and knew what was going on and was trying his dang just to communicate that. But, you know, how many times has he sat in Jaden's corner? You know, how long has he had a relationship with Jaden Cox? Those are all things. Those are the things that Dennis is talking about, I think. And um, it's, it's crucial. It's critical. 
So, you know, there's that, that's one of those things. But at the same time, the athlete should be aware. There's no excuse for that. If that's really what happened, there's no excuse for that. You have to know the criteria. You have to know the situation. Dennis, your thoughts on his performance as a whole? I mean, we got a kid right off the college mats. He's, he's a two-time national champion, uh, had a great trials, came from an eight seed to a bronze medal. I mean, th- this is something that, you know, <laughs> We've got some athletes that have done that before, but at 21 years old, this guy's definitely got some cycles in him. I mean, what's it, what's it like for you to watch him as a Greco guy going, man, he's, he's definitely fun to watch. No, it is. He was fun to watch. Very tough to score on and, and explosive as heck. Uh, you know, just hopefully we can keep him around. I, you know, you you got to keep guys like that for two or three cycles. I mean, realistically, he could be on three Olympic teams pretty easy, you know, so – that's a challenge in our sport is keeping guys like him around that that uh, can win you know seven eight medals for us. All right, Kyle Snyder. This is uh, the, the twenty years old. He's won the worlds, the NCAA's, and the Olympics within a calendar year. Dennis Hall, what's your impression of this young man and, and what you've just seen from him? Uh, you know, being being in the Greco side, just watching how much he's he's just become. And I, you know, as as Terry said about that Jordan Burroughs, I think Kyle Snyder's well on his way becoming an icon in the sport of wrestling. What do you think about what you saw from Kyle Snyder the last the last fifteen months? He's an animal. I mean, the guy keeps coming at you, and he's going to find a way to break you. Uh, he doesn't get upset when he's down by points. I mean, I, I remember the match; he's down by four zero, and he ends up winning nine four. I mean, he just breaks guys, and that's the thing. I, he's always attacking. He's always He's heavy on your head, and that wears a lot of his opponents down. I mean, if you watch matches, you can tell every time he puts that hand on the head, the guy, the guy's working his tail off to get it off. And uh, just a phenomenal athlete, just, in my estimation, just an animal. That simple. Now, Terry, there's something about Kyle that uh, we have saw through this year that, you know, when Jordan Burroughs broke on the scene, he was going undefeated. He was beating people. Kyle Snyder took losses this year. He lost to Boltakayev from Russia. He lost to Gazumov from Azerbaijan, who he beat in the gold medal final. How important were those losses to him in winning an Olympic gold medal? Well, I mean, what if he would have beat him? Does that mean that he didn't win the Olympic gold medal then? I mean, I don't know. It's, I'm <laughs> throwing that out there. You're 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 an expert I, in yeah, coaching. I, <laughs> I mean, you 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 take it as it goes. If you win, you feel good about it, and if you get beat, you go back to the drawing board and and figure it out and fix it. And if you win, you still go back to the drawing board and figure it out and fix it. So, you know, it's one of those things where I don't think he had to take the loss to be the Olympic gold medal. But, you know, yeah, he, he, you know he can still do the same thing and take the Olympic gold medal by by winning and beating and winning those matches. So, you know, I mean, he lost to Boltakayev, and Boltakayev couldn't even stand up at the, at the Olympic Games this year. He lost to Boltakayev and Kresne Yards. You know, and so, you know, both the Coyotes plus two. He's plus two kilo on that. And who knows what he's doing other than that. So, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. And, you know, Kyle Snyder's kind of hybrid. He's halfway in between, you know, getting ready to wrestle for Ohio State and going to Crescent Yards to get ready for the, you know, the games in Rio and that kind of thing. So, you know, right? You know what I'm saying there? So, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of dynamics, and, you know, it's all points toward preparation, and that's what you want. You want to have it all point toward preparation, and the preparation, the ultimate, was to win the NCAA championship at the given time and to win the uh, Olympic gold medal when that came up, and, you know, he did both of them, so it was a success. The journey was a success, but do you want to take the loss? No. I, I don't think I would, and I don't think he was trying to take a loss there, but there is a learning piece there. You learn when you win, you learn when you lose. It's how you compete is what you take the most from. How, how did he compete in Krasnoyarsk? Well, he was a freaking animal in Krasnoyarsk, too. You know, he just, that guy cartwheeled out of some situations and did some freak things to him. So we're moving forward, you know, either way. So I guess perhaps um, more what I was angling for, well, it's not necessarily the win the loss, but the, the importance of being able to get your hands on somebody at least once before wrestling him in a, in a, in a high-profile situation. I mean, if he doesn't wrestle Kazuma he, off in, the, in he's that, that so wing. He's so solid that, you know, he had never wrestled 
Um, let's see. Let me think here. Last year, was that the first time that he'd wrestled uh, Gadisov last year? I believe so. I know he'd wrestled. You know, so, you know, but it was a world championship. It was the world championships. It was the gold medal coming up, you know. So that's really what it's about. You point to that. And no matter who's in your way, you got to figure out a way to win that, whether you got beat them or whether you didn't beat them or whether you haven't wrestled them. And so those are where you're at as a coach, and you take them as they come. And then you learn and you build and you move forward, and all those pieces are working together, you know, for the benefit of the athlete to accomplish the highest goal when that, you know, when that event, you know, rears its ugly head and you're there. And he was there and that he was at the perfect time and the perfect place in history and won the gold medal. And he did it. Like Dennis said, he's a freaking animal. He doesn't stop coming at you. He doesn't stop. He's never out of position. He doesn't stop coming at you. He never stops looking for an angle. He never stops looking for a way to expose your opponent. And it's brutal against those guys. And Gajimov impressed me. He was kind of in shape. And that's something that, that's uh, uncommon for him. There's a couple other performances I want to I, I want to look at Frank Molinaro just for a minute because this is a guy who got a, a, a last, last second chance to get into the games, and he's literally an inch away from winning a bronze medal. Uh, Terry, from what you saw about Molinaro, I mean, one, he, it's the, the, the trend continues. He can't go five seconds in a match without getting slapped in the face or punched in the face for no, no apparent reason. But, uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's a trains out of Penn state. Uh, that was Brent's weight class. But what did you think about Frank Molinaro's performance at the games? I mean, I, I wrote well, that there was no shame in his fifth place performance. Well, I, I said the last time we were on a call together, I said, he's getting better every time and he's going to be a contender. He's going to be a contender in uh, Rio. I, I believe that. I, I thought he was going to be a contender, and maybe he was. Um, you know, it's one of those things where you're in that match for that for that um, bronze medal, and, he, and the way that he's in it, get your hand raised, you know. Get your hand raised. And so was he a contender? I don't know if he was really ready to win to get beat 10 by Askarov in Azerbaijan. So I don't know. I, I love, I love the fact that he was there. I love the way that he qualified a weight class. He could have tanked when he got beat out of that last qualifier. And because he didn't, and because he fought back, even though there was no way he could qualify by getting in the top two because of the way that he fought back. And he really wasn't, as most people say, he wasn't wrestling for anything. Well, he was wrestling because he's a wrestler and that's a big, big deal. So, uh, you know, that's what really put us in the place in the first place there. So, you know, that's huge. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I don't know that you have to hang your head ever. So, you know, he's moving forward, and he was our guy, and he earned it, and he, he was the best guy at the weight coming out of the country this year. He proved it. So, you know, we, we needed him to step up and win that gold medal. Yeah, Tervel Delagna wrestled for a bronze medal, but I think we all know that that Tervel's uh, didn't really train much after winning the spot. He was pretty much walking wounded. But man, to get out there with with basically you know struggling to walk most of the time to get to make the semifinals uh, in his bronze medal match, one good shot was all he had, and then I mean he went after it. And you know it's kind of hard to see a guy like Tervel, who's just such a, a great human being, go out like that. But uh, I think somebody posted in every single international tournament in his career was, I think since uh, he got on the senior level, he wrestled for a medal. That's really hard. I mean, he was no worse than fifth ever at any international tournament. That's quite impressive. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like you said, you know, you're, you're, uh, if you're him, you're figuring out the pieces and, you know, and whether he wrestles again, again, from where I'm at, that's not the point. The point is, is that you're getting better and you're moving, you're advancing your, your humanity forward and you're advancing yourself forward to help humanity grow and to become better. And so he's got to figure out what the situation was there. You know, maybe, maybe through his, you know, ordeal there, he's going to have a, a figure out a way to be able to help people that are in his place five, six, seven, ten years down the road that are, that are like that if we ever have that happen again. And there's ways to do that. So, you know, again, it, you know, I don't know how he felt necessarily. So, you know, you're, gosh, you know, you're, you're, like you said, you're just really 
you know, we're fortunate that he's an American. And yeah, I don't know what else to say. All right, now we got to move off to a couple different things. That while while we have time, we, this next topic could probably take a whole episode. But uh, just uh, let's just start with Greco, Dennis. Rules that need to probably be tweaked. I know that United World Wrestling doesn't want to change the rules because that was kind of the knock on it. And Lalovic has said in public, he's like, we can't change the rules. Well, we can't change the rules. Well, it's been three years since we've had pretty much these rules in both styles. We've had tweak here, tweak there. From a Greco-Roman standpoint, Dennis, start with you. What rules do you think need to be slightly modified or modified to make our product in Greco-Roman wrestling better? Uh, don't give a point for the second passivity. Our, um, right now, you have the guy from uh, uh, Serbia, correct, at 49, and a, or uh, at he wrestled the Armenian in the finals. Yes, he did the, not yeah, score. Yep. He did not score one legitimate point in the match, but wins an Olympic gold medal. And then he ran for the last 40 seconds in a match, and that's okay. I don't get it. I, you know, so I think that Pat awarding a point for a passivity, you know what, make guys score points, and it takes the matches out of the referee's hands. If for some reason everything's tied, put three minutes up on the clock. Overtime's a good thing. I I think uh, you force the guys to score points. Um, you know, and that that's about the only thing you really need to change is um, not giving matches away and not giving the power to the officials. I mean, otherwise, you know what? We just get, in the U.S. We just got to get better in parterre. I mean, I have no problem with that. You know, with them not changing any rules, but don't take the power out of the officials' hands. You see it every single game, and, and it's horrible. Terry, I think we saw a lot more of this on the freestyle side, especially with um, you know two matches that, that jump out, Franklin Gomez especially. But uh, you know, from a a coaching perspective and, and a rules perspective, on how to how to coach and how to you know make a better product. I mean, it's not your job as a coach to make a better product. It's a, it's your job to get the athletes to work within the rules and win. But when you look at some of the things that happened with the officiating in those, those last few days in freestyle, what are some things you think need to be tweaked to make it a better product to give the athletes a better chance to show that this is why we're here. We don't need to win on a technicality. We need to win because we're the better wrestler. Well, okay. How are you going to do that? Um, the rules are the rules, right? I'd say for the most part, we've got a better system than we did before the ball draw. That's for sure. <laughs> Okay, so how about the way that we select officials? Yeah, that's not something I have much experience in. I know that um, somebody asked the other day, they're like, hey, did they post who the officials were before the Olympics? And they absolutely did. So we know who the officials were coming in. So I know there's a... Okay, but you have, you have two guys that are possibly as crooked as a day is long of, uh, signing officials during the Olympic Games. And you have a serious a serious, uh, what do you call it, um, where, where you have uh, an interest that isn't, where, where you, you don't have the best interest of somebody, or where you set up an official to be on a mat that there's no way in hell he should be on that mat. You know, those two guys that are making those calls, that's absolutely ridiculous. That, that needs to be... Uh, Changed. There needs to be those guys need to be gone. They need to be fired. They need to be off the FIBA bureau, the UWW bureau. I mean, these people are are the the, the, the worst of the worst when it comes to buying and, and cheating and selling and stuff. Period. So it's less about the rules. You're looking for more officials' oversight. There needs to be some more governance and be like, hey, we we need to overhaul how. Our, our officials do things versus, you know, the rules will take care of themselves. Am I, am I getting that? Freestyle wrestling, what's broken with freestyle wrestling? I mean, it was a 1-1 match with Jade Cox in his, in his bronze medal match, and that was a very entertaining match. Freestyle wrestling is awesome. I mean, you have 7-7s, seven you have 10-7s, you have 7-0s, you have, you have three true wins, and they're good. These are good matches other than the uh, – the uh, Kenny Shibili and um, Higuchi from Japan at 57 kilo. Where why did they put him on the? Why did they put him on the clock? Kenny Shibili's hanging on the dress. 
I have not a clue. I'm, that was one. That was one of the situations I was scratching my head on. Okay, that's an official. That's a thing where an official steps in and wants to change the course of a match. Mm-hmm. How does that happen? Where are the allegiances? The guy that makes the mat assignment. Where is he from? You know, let's start drawing. Let's start the, using some common sense and connect connecting the dots in this stuff. And you know, I know USA Wrestling is aware of it. And I know that they want to make a change, so make a change. Go stir up enough whatevers to make the change, just like the Mongolians did. I loved what the Mongolians did. You know, we had a we had a wonder. That. We wonder what Tom and Terry would think about that. Everybody around the world was thinking that they're going. Are the brands going to start taking off their clothes at matches now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I bet they were. I bet they were. <laughs> but you know what? I love that because they're not standing for it. That's an unprecedented call at this Olympic game. You have to stop the match. You have to say, attention, you run again, we're going to hit you. Yeah. And he wouldn't have run again. They, that's the rule. That's what they told us they were going to do. You start running at the end of the match, you're going to stop it immediately. They're going to put you under attention. If you do it again, you're going to get hit. They never did that. They never gave him a chance to to feel that. And that's the same guy that got a call against, against Gomez, Gomez yep. with the same country of the guy who assigns the mat official. So connect the dots. I don't need to tell you what's going on right now. Connect the dots. And then you tell me, what's the solution here? Because what Dennis is saying is, Part, part of that's going on. What about the Russian when he got thrown by Korea? Was that not four points? I like to think it was, just because I, that, the way I understand it, but it seems like a lot of the officials that were sitting in front of me seem to think two. So, uh, yeah, it, was that four yeah. points? I, I thought it was. I thought it was. My gosh, if that's yeah. not four points, it's five. <laughs> if it's not five I mean, it's and four. the thing is, what what about the Croatian and Bezik, uh, that Bezik lost to? He, he not, I mean, what skull was knocked out? You know what? You have a choice. Roll your back and give up to or take what's coming to you. And then they take a, it should have been a fall. I mean, I, yeah, the choke I don't out. know. You got it. I, I agree with you. Okay. Yeah. So no, when you look I mean, at that stuff and then you have. For a bronze medal. Right. I agree. And you have, you know, no offense to TR Foley, but you have Foley going, no, that's two points. Why is it two points? Because you're friends with Dan Desic? And Dan Desic said it was two, so it's two? That's that's horrible. That's horrible. That's a horrible way to go through the sport, and that's the problem right there. Exactly. You have these guys that are on the bureau that, that they're narcissistic and they are never wrong. And they, they made a lot of bad they made a lot of bad calls. Now with Greco, I don't know what the answer is because you probably gotta tweak the rules. You gotta get it where there's not so much you know, or you're just throwing points out there. Or you're just putting one guy, just handpicking a guy to be down. I don't know the answer there. I mean, all I can tell you is in Greco, we go down a lot more than all the foreigners, the U.S. guys. And that is a problem. But at the same time, you know what? We got to score on our feet, too. If we score on our feet, we ain't going to get, we won't get put down as much. And that's what I said to Provisor when he, he came to me. He goes, do you believe they put me down? I go, yeah, I can believe yeah, it. I believe you're it. scoring a point. you yeah. you got you to mean, score points, man. You should have scored so three points you. when you knocked the guy down three times. I, he left six points on the mat. Yep. Yep, and I agree. That's exactly right. So how do you do that? I mean, how, how do you do that? Well, you got to get better. How do you get better? Well, do the rules allow me to be able to do that stuff? Yeah. So, sure. I mean, I uh, the rules are fine. It's just take the power out of the referee's hands, and then we got to make the changes as coaches and as athletes and get our minds right. This is one of the, like, again, the topics. I just want to need to get you two in a room and, and, and a recorder and just hit record and just let you guys go at it because I think we could go another hour and a half, two hours on this because uh, it, it's that important to the coaches and the, and the future of the sport. But for now, uh, we're just going to have to cut episode 32 uh, to an end, we'll just close with Dennis. Your final thoughts about uh, the Olympic Games, um, its its relevance, 
the sport of wrestling bracket. What were your general takeaways? Everything, everything that you know about the games, whether it be Ben, the the, the opening ceremonies, Greco Roman freestyle, Helen Marulis. Your final thoughts about uh, the Olympics Rio twenty sixteen. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate all the medal winners and all the participants in the sport. You know, somebody's going to win, somebody's going to lose. So every one of them's got to uh, really understand what they've done by competing in the Olympics. And, you know, if you didn't get the result you want, go back to the drawing board and come back in four years and try again. Um, the Olympics, I thought, were uh, put on really good, you know, except for some of the roughing incidents. I think uh, they, uh, our organization that oversees that needs to start making changes and, and start addressing those issues. I you know, everybody says the Mongolian case was, you know, with the coaches stripping down in their underwear, um, was bad for the sport. Now it just showed what really goes on. And that's what the average person doesn't get. You know, you need to fix the problems. And then the sport will be one of the best sports in the world. Terry, your final thoughts. I would say that I big reach out to Brian or Kyle Snyder and Helen Morales for really accomplishing what the sport is about. And that's the Olympic gold medal. That's the highest pinnacle of the sport, and that's something that you know we should always be looking to attain. So that's that's number one. Um, I agree with what what Dennis said right there. You have the proper poopers up there that are sitting there drinking eat Earl Grey tea, and they're all worried about the about the uh, um, the uh, what, what, what am I looking for? The way that the perception that our sport is looked at, and that's ridiculous. That's an awesome thing that happened because it was the wrong call. It was the wrong call, and they they know it's a wrong call, and that's why they did that. And you know what? The IOC should look at that and tell tell wrestling to uh, yeah, hey, fix it, guys, fix it, man. And then we should go. Oh, hey, how do we fix it? And then fix it instead of worrying about who's in power and. And how you know my my uh, my my pockets are going to be affected because I don't want to. If I fix this, I, my pockets are going to be affected, and this and that. And then the last thing I want to say is, wrestling's the purest and, and greatest sport, and we know that. And we need to continue to build that, and bring it. We had a great announcer, Jason. I thought you did an unbelievable job. You're all business, but you have a personality and inflection in your voice that is very personable at the same time. So I really, you know, you know, I told you when we were in Vegas about that, and I think that you added a lot to just me. Maybe it's, I'm the only one that's saying this, but my ability to be able to sit in that arena for, for those three days and freestyle and listen to you call those guys in the mat was huge because it was real. The inflection was right. You were there. You were about the business. You were about the winning. You were about calling the guys in the mat the right way. And it wasn't like you were, you know, having a laugh session in a swimming pool with a bunch of kids. And that's really what I appreciated. Again, I appreciate that uh, that a lot. Again, co- coming from you means a lot. And uh, for those of you listening, uh, we are World Wrestling Resource at worldwrestlingresource.com. For Dennis Hall and Terry Brands, my name is Jason Bryant. We'll see you next time. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.